Okay, everybody, buckle up, because it's a Friday, and it's not just Friday. It's not just a Friday in 2019. It is Friday in 2019 where Donald Trump had a press conference, and it was a doozy. So we're going to be showing you some video uh, from that. So if you'd like to pour yourself a drink now, probably not a bad idea. But outside of the national emergency, which we are, I was going to say now in, but apparently it's just we have been in one, and finally it's been declared. You probably know because the war has probably come to your door. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about other stuff as well. So uh, the DNC has finally released some concrete details on how exactly they're going to figure out who is going to be on the debate stage come June once we start the 12 different debates that will make up this primary uh, uh, season. We're going to be breaking it down, some good, some bad from that. Uh, we're also going to have an interview with one gentleman who hopes to be on that stage as Andrew Yang, who is uh, pursuing the Democratic nomination. He is running on a platform of a number of different things, but uh, in particular, universal basic income and a proposal he has around that. We're going to be talking with him a little bit later on uh, about that. We also have uh, Josie Duffy Rice is going to be joining us for the first time on the Damage Report to talk about uh, recent criminal justice legislation that was passed, uh, the future of where that could go over the next two years of the Trump presidency uh, and more. And I, if we have time, and I don't know that we will, we're going to close out the show uh, by scaring the hell out of you over how likely it is that people, the big, the biggest Trump supporters, the ones who are most devoted to him, can actually be convinced of things that go against their predispositions. We have uh, polling data on uh, what media sources they trust and which they don't, and it, that is going to be a lot of fun. But first, the disaster. As was announced yesterday, Donald Trump is signing the border deal, so we're not going to have a shutdown, but we do have a national emergency. So I guess you win some, you lose some. And we're going to get into his arguments as to why that is necessary, and also his arguments as to why that's not necessary, because he did both during a press conference. Um, we're going to get into exactly how he is going to take money and use it to build the wall. But before we do that, hypocrisy alert, we're going to show is he being consistent with what he has previously said about national emergencies? But I want to be clear, I'm not doing this because I think it will convince anyone. I'm only doing it, I guess, to write one more line in the obituary for American democracy, because I know that nobody cares about this, nothing matters. But here is what Donald Trump said back in November of 2014, when Barack Obama was considering issuing an executive order around immigration not to build a wall or to bar people from coming in, but to extend benefits to a group in the US. Donald Trump said then, Repubs must not allow President Obama to subvert the Constitution of the US for his own benefit and because he is unable to negotiate with Congress. Uh, proving once again that not only is there always a tweet, we know that, but the tweet is always going to be oddly specific as to the situation we're in. So this is coming directly after the, it's not to some extent the failure of the Republicans to negotiate to continue the functioning of government. They were able to get that, but not to his satisfaction. And because he doesn't like the deal he's getting coming out of that, he is not only doing an executive order, which he directly says Trump that Obama shouldn't have done, and on this particular issue, but he's also declaring a national emergency. So not just that. I mean, you got Trump, obviously. I don't know if we can really expect him to be consistent, but Mike Pence as well, who is you know very in favor of this. Uh, let's do a little um, walk down memory lane uh, during uh, Barack Obama when he was in a similar situation uh, from the point of view of the vice president. I think it would be a profound mistake for the president of the United States to overturn American immigration law with the stroke of a pen. Uh, issues of this magnitude should always be resolved with the consent of the governed. Signing an executive order, giving a speech, barnstorming around the country uh, defending that executive order uh, is not leadership. And I, I would implore the president to reconsider this path. Again, oddly specific uh, with the not only the stroke of the pen uh, and effectively rewriting immigration law by, in this case, building a you know possibly thousands of miles long wall on the border, but also barnstorming around the country. He's just back from a trip to El Paso where he was doing exactly that. So Mike Pence, uh, a little bit of a fortune teller there, who's looking into the future and he could see exactly where things were going. Um, but again. Does it matter? I mean, they've both said don't do this exact thing. Mitch McConnell, we could go through his history. I'm sure he was not a fan of what Barack Obama was doing, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't convince anyone, unfortunately. I just leave it there as a note for people when they look back on this age that 
some of us understood how ridiculous things were uh, that were going on. In any event, what is Donald Trump going to do with these new funds? How is he going to actually build the wall? We know that he's not satisfied with the $1.375 trillion that Democrats and Republicans have allocated for 55 miles of steel or steel bollard fencing. He wants much more. So where is he going to get it? Where is it going to come from? Well, White House Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney said today that the president will seek to divert about $6.7 billion from elsewhere in the government to build 200, sorry, 234 miles of steel bollard wall. There it's called a wall. In another 10 seconds, it'll be called a fence. God only knows at this point. Included in that will be $2.5 billion from Mr. Tr- that Mr. Trump will divert from the Department of Defense's counter drug efforts, $600 million from the Treasury, uh, Treasury Forfeiture Fund, and $3.6 billion from military construction efforts. And each component of that is just delicious in its irony. Why? So we, we got to build a wall. So we need to take this money to build the wall. Why do we need to build the wall? Well, he's got a couple of reasons. But the number one number one reason that he lists is to stop drugs from coming into this country. Now, everybody who's in the know on this topic knows that a wall on the border is going to do virtually nothing to stop drugs from coming into this country because they generally come in through ports of entry. But they say the wall will help in that. So where are they going to get the money from the wall? Well, they're going to take $2.5 billion from counter drug efforts. Now, I can't say for sure that that money was being allocated perfectly well by the Department of Defense, but I have a feeling that it was probably a little bit more data driven than Donald Trump's most recent whim. So they're literally taking billions of dollars that were being used to stop drugs from coming in this country and throwing it up in a wall that is gonna do nothing to stop drugs from coming in this country. Again, it will prove unconvincing to Trump supporters, but I just wanna note it. As well, $3.6 billion are coming from military construction efforts. So look, there are two, two ways that you can read that, I think. One is that those $3.6 billion hypothetically would have been used for some sort of military construction, either here inside of the US or abroad. And the Department of Defense would make some sort of argument as to why we needed those particular constructions. You can believe that or you can not believe that. So maybe they're gonna use it. He will make the case that they weren't really gonna use it for anything, that there were just literally billions of dollars just waiting around to be thrown down on the southern border in the form of a steel bollard fence. I would say, as someone who would like to see that uh, the Department of Defense uh, budget go down someday, if we have identified billions of dollars of easily reroutable money, perhaps that money shouldn't have been allocated in the first place. And generally, I know that on a far smaller scale, if you get you know X budget for your office, and it turns out that you didn't need a bunch of it, the next year, they don't give you as much. Why is that a standard that we would apply to a Jimmy John's, but we won't apply to the Department of Defense when the amount of funding is exponentially larger? But that point will, of course, be lost in all of what else is going on. I want to add one more thing to this, though, and that is Mick Mulvaney, we previously had cited. He talks about why Donald Trump is doing this. We're going to get Donald Trump in just a little bit on this, but first, Mick Mulvaney. He said the president was taking executive action because Congress had proved, quote, simply incapable of allowing the level of wall funding Mr. Trump had demanded. Now, if you sort of just casually follow the daily goings on in DC, that sounds like the sort of sentence that makes sense in in politics. You've got a guy who works in the office, you've got a politician who's not happy with what's going on, and some money is moving around. But think about what is actually being said there. They've proved simply incapable of allowing the level of wall funding. It's not up to Donald Trump to figure out how much money should go to the wall. As president, he can of course give recommendations to his party in the House in terms of what his budgetary priorities are. But even in the best of times, when he controls the House, it is not at the end of day, at the end of the day, up to him. The power of the purse, as they always say, lies in Congress. And that is even doubly the case when he does not control the House of Representatives. Who is he to say that I told you guys what I wanted, you didn't do it, and so now you've proved extraneous. We don't need Congress anymore. Maybe if you give me what I want, I'll continue to allow you to sit in that that fancy room and draw a salary and all that. But if you ever defy me, eh, I can do executive orders and I can declare a national emergency. Doesn't even matter if everybody knows it's a sham, I can just do it. So that little sentence there in that is so much more. That is effectively a constitutional crisis in less than 280 characters. That is the president declaring that if he has a priority, whether real or imagined or designed to advance his chances in 2020, Congress, an entire branch of government, eh, do we really need it anymore? That is not scaring people nearly as much as I think that it should. 
Now, a little bit later on the show, we are gonna return to his press conference that was conducted earlier today. That probably will scare you, um, but we'll have that in just a little bit. When we come back, Josie Duffy Rice is gonna join us. We're gonna be talking criminal justice reform after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Join us now to break down the latest legislation on criminal justice reform and where we might go from here over the next couple of years. Josie Duffy Rice, a senior reporter at The Appeal and host of Justice in America podcast. Josie, welcome to The Damage Report. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, very glad to have you here. Very excited to talk about these topics with you. Uh, we're going to turn in a second to some of the recent legislation. But first, the Justice in America podcast. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we are, um, I'm, it's co-hosted by me and Clint Smith. And what we do is try to provide a primer for people who might be interested in criminal justice, know it's something that they should care about, you know, think that mass incarceration is a problem, but don't know how the system works. So um, we go issue by issue, we interview experts, and we also try to um, provide context for how the system is affecting certain communities, um, people of color, poor people, um, and how it really functions day to day. Uh, it's possible that you know I, I have to follow the news constantly because of my job. Maybe I'm in a bubble, but it seems like over the past few years this has become a more salient and you know often talked about topic. You know, through the the, the efforts of movements like Black Lives Matters, the you know a number of different tragedies involving the police across the country over the past few years. Do you feel like people are paying more attention to this topic than they used to? I do. I feel like it is gaining traction. You know, when I um, first started really thinking about this stuff and working at the public defender's office 10 years ago, nobody knew what a prosecutor did. Nobody talked about this or, or, or many, many fewer people talked about this. Um, that being said, you know, it's still really complicated and it's opaque in a way that's intentional. And so people you know, know that there's a problem, but they're not always totally sure where the problem is, at what stages, exactly who you know is responsible for the problem, where the obstacles are, and so you want to be able to arm people, especially people in a democratic system where you know they're electing a lot of the people in charge of these systems. You want to be able to arm them with the tools to know who they're choosing and what decisions they should be making. And maybe this is an example of that, but I feel like this last cycle with organizations like Real Justice PAC and other sort of pushing. Like the idea that maybe we should pay attention to you know who is actually in these positions at the local level, not just paying attention to what the Department of Justice is doing. I feel like there might be a, a sort of growing awareness of how people can actually get involved. And so uh, your podcast seems like a great way for people to learn about that process as well. Yeah, I recommend it. But it is true that you know there are people, especially talking about prosecutors now, in a way that. Really matters. You know, you your local prosecutor has a ton of control over what happens to people in your jurisdiction, and most people don't even know who theirs is. So um, it's good to see kind of more attention being paid to that. And in this topic, uh, Congress recently paid more attention to it. Uh, not that long ago, we had the First Step Act that was passed. It was uh, bipartisan criminal justice uh, legislation, and the reception seemed pretty positive for the most part. As an expert in this area, how did you receive that law? 
You know, I think any move towards less incarceration um, is an, a really important thing uh, or, or better conditions um, for uh, people in, in the system, better options for them to be able to get better treatment and also um, have opportunities at release. Um, I think there are things that are concerning about it. Uh, it falls short in a lot of ways. It doesn't involve sentencing reform, which really, really, really is critical. It um, relies on algorithms which can be biased and which have not yet proven themselves as worthwhile tools for which we should be making decisions about people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I think ultimately the, the overarching problem is just that it doesn't go far enough. We have a serious problem in this country. We have almost you know, two and a half million people in prison. We have 12 million people cycling through prison, um, jails every year. Um, that's a, a, an incredible amount of people. And without doing, going much further and much bolder, we're not gonna make the sort of dent we need to make to create a fair system. Um, and we're just not there yet. And of course, one concern is once Congress finally acts in an area, the worry can be that, oh, they'll feel like their job is done and they might not return to it for a year yeah. or five years or 10, unfortunately. Yeah, um, and I think how, how it was so hard to get this much done. You know, it's a little it's a little worrisome of how we're gonna get, get more done on the federal level. Now, uh, let, let's stay on the federal level. Uh, just in the past 24 hours, we had uh, William Barr uh, once again confirmed to be the Attorney General uh, of the United States. Um, you know, based on what you've, you, you know about him and the sort of context around, you know, what he might represent as AG, what do you think about the next couple of years of the Department of Justice and criminal justice uh, under William Barr? I, I don't feel great about it. Um, William Barr is not much different than his predecessor, Jeff Sessions, when it comes to these issues. Um, you know, he was a deputy attorney general in the early 90s, an attorney general in, you know, in the early 90s, and pushed for more incarceration, more laws to, um, to more tough on crime legislation. You know, he wrote or he signed off in 1992 on a DOJ report called The Case for More Incarceration. And this is, of course, during our most, our most, carc most increase incarceration um, decade that uh, our country has ever seen. Um, he's denied the existence of racial disparities in the system. He's denied the existence of um, too harsh punishments. He has not seemed open to thinking about criminal justice reform as a way to not only improve the lives of people in the system, but improve the lives of all of us um, and really rethink the way that we consider punishment. Um, so I don't think, I wouldn't consider him an ally. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that this uh, there's always opportunity to talk to people and work with them to try to get some of this the change that we need to see um, implemented. But I think it's going to be a long slog. Yeah, especially when much of that description that you just gave could uh, apply to Jeff Sessions just as much as William Barr. So that should that should certainly scare people. Uh, we also. Uh, you, you were mentioning prosecutors and people's you know, awareness of prosecutors. I am curious, um, we, we have at least two, we might have more candidates for the Democratic nomination for the presidency who have previously worked as prosecutors. Um, based on what you know about, not, not necessarily those individuals, but people in that system, what do you think that that might bring to their candidacies? Obviously, people are concerned about what it might represent. You know, I, I think that um, it adds a layer of complication to people who um, want this job because being a prosecutor inevitably means making thousands of decisions um, over you know over a period of years about people's lives um, and and I think that a lot of those decisions um, could possibly raise cause for, for concern that being said I, I also think that um, one of the principles of the criminal justice reform kind of movement is to talk about what it means to change and to um, reconsider what the decisions that you've made and to um, to look back and, and recognize when maybe you've made a mistake. My hope is that um, this op offers actually an opportunity for us to talk about what how prosecution has changed, you know, how people's views have evolved and um, what it means to have that kind of control over people's lives. So as long as it doesn't become just a singular benefit without criticism, I, I don't think it necessarily is an inhibit, you know, an inhibition to someone being a good president. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it requires a level of um, of reckoning. 
And I think that it's entirely possible with the number of Democratic debates we're going to have that we might possibly have that reckoning. Uh, nope. Josie Duffy Rice, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, lending your expertise to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We come back. Donald Trump's press conference. Buckle up. Welcome back to the show, everyone. So we've gotten to the part of the program where you have to listen to Donald Trump. I apologize in advance. We got a couple of videos, some of them fun, some of them horrifying. You decide which is which. First, in Donald Trump's press conference, he has declared a national emergency. We know that. We also know, and he's going to acknowledge that there's likely to be court challenges to this. So. Considering that he's already gone through this with the Muslim ban and other issues, he has to be very careful with his language to not give ammunition to the opposition. Let's see if he's up to the task in this first clip. I want to do it faster. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this, but I'd rather do it much faster. And I don't have to do it for the election. I've already done a lot of wall for the election, 2020. And the only reason we're up here talking about this is because of the election. Because they want to try and win an election, which it looks like they're not going to be able to do. And this is one of the ways they think they can possibly win is by obstruction and a lot of other nonsense. Somewhere in a room in ACLU headquarters, there's lawyers like, did he just steal our job? <laughs> because he just made all of the arguments against this. So he didn't need to do this. That's a bit on the nose, but thank you, Donald Trump, for saying that. Uh, saying, uh, I already built wall for, you know, for the campaign. This is all about the election. The only reason we're here is for the election. You're the one who thinks there's a national emergency. Okay, maybe you don't really think that, but that's the part that you're here to play. Read your lines, you idiot. Ann Coulter is screaming somewhere. She's so frustrated with you. So it, he didn't need to do this. If headlines in tomorrow's newspapers should just be, he didn't need to do this in quotation marks. I mean, we will make the case, the media make the, will make the case, rational people will make the case that he didn't need to do this, but he is the one saying that he didn't need to do this. This is obviously a sideshow. He admits it's about the election. Of course, he projects onto the Democrats, but the Democrats didn't want to have a debate about the wall. We didn't want to make the last election about uh, immigration. He's the one continually doing that, and you see it out of almost every quote from him. So on the same sort of topic, he says, I'm going to be signing a national emergency, and it's been signed many times before. There's rarely been a problem. They sign it, nobody cares. So if you needed a little bit more of a response to the question, does he take this process seriously? Does he consider it with the, the level of importance and gravitas that declaring a national emergency of the country should bear? Well, he says nobody cares, just eh, whatever. Doesn't really matter that it happens. Um, so. The challenges are going to come. He has now provided ammunition. You have to imagine that he's thinking about this process. And it turns out that in this press conference, he talks about the process a little bit in his own unique Trumpian way. In the final papers, as soon as I get into the Oval Office, and we will have a national emergency, and we will then be sued, and they will sue us in the Ninth Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there. And we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake, and we'll win in the Supreme Court. Just like the ban, they sued us in the Ninth Circuit, and we lost, and then we lost in the appellate division, and then we went to the Supreme Court, and we won. And it was very interesting. It was very, it was very interesting. I. I wish that my vocal cords could produce a sound that simultaneously expresses the sheer sadness and depression and rage that I feel all at once. I don't think we have a word in the English language. That was not edited. That wasn't like, here's a weird sing-songy excerpt and we'll string them all together. That was him choosing to do that. That was his press conference. We didn't like stop him on his way to the chopper. He had that planned, and that's what he said. And I know, I know that the percentage of the audience that's Donald Trump supporters is probably fairly low. But if any of you are listening, how do you listen to that and think, that's my guy? I want that guy to be the most powerful guy of all the guys. But there's real, there's a lot of people who believe that. 
and think that that, I wouldn't trust him to button his jacket. And he is declaring national emergencies right now. And that's the way he talks about it. So look, the challenge is coming. I think they're probably gonna have a pretty good case. It is possible that they will just roll in a TV and play his press conference and it's gonna be pretty compelling. Anyway, let's move on to other topics. Donald Trump, in the context of you know all of his talk about the wall, obviously drugs is a big portion of his concern about this. Let's see what his argument is as to the wall's ability to stop drugs. What are some other ways to stop drugs as well? Their criminal list is much tougher than our criminal list. Their criminal list, a drug dealer gets a thing called the death penalty. Our criminal list, a drug dealer gets a thing called, how about a fine? And when I asked President Xi, I said, do you have a drug problem? No, no, no. I said, you have 1.4 billion people. What do you mean you have no drug problem? No, we don't have a drug problem. I said, why? Death penalty. We give death penalty to people that sell drugs. End of problem. The only thing that complicates me making the case that right there he was sort of doing a weird racist mocking of the way the president of China speaks is that he also kind of speaks like that. But you could tell that that's what he was going for there. So there he's talking about how they do things in other countries. And on our criminal list, whatever that is, nobody knows what he's talking about. We were having that talk during the video. They kill people for selling drugs. And we give them, how about a fine? Well, that is gonna be news for all of the people locked up for, for selling drugs in our country. Uh, they should have apparently just paid a fine, I guess. But Donald Trump, this guy who is literally in the middle of seizing power over an imagined threat at the border to take billions of dollars to build a wall, is talking favorably about dictators and other governments, authoritarian governments around the world that will literally kill people for selling drugs. On any day other than this, okay, maybe he should get away with this. But this is when he's doing his power grab. How are people not taking seriously the idea that this guy wants to be more free to kill people for nonviolent crimes? And understand, this isn't just a weird anecdote from him. I mean, I guess it's a series of weird anecdotes, but he's been talking about murder people over selling drugs for literally years at this point. And so will he ever actually act on it? Will he do an executive order? Can he do an executive order? Will he be stopped if he can't technically do it? I honestly have no idea, he's backed off from it before, but I can't guarantee that he will do that again in the future. Now, there's, there's more nonsense, of course. Uh, at one point, um, he was asked about uh, the fact that drugs come mostly through ports of entry, and he said, it's just a lie, it's all a lie. It's not a lie, I mean, your DEA says it. There was a series of questioning that was very specific about why don't you trust your own government statistics on this? And he just started talking about how he likes Homeland Security and how you've got worse statistics than I have. First of all, how, how do you know that? Why wouldn't you have them? What's the point of any of this? I don't know why I'm trying to reason with him. The entire thing has been obviously incredibly frustrating. Uh, if we're backing off just a little bit, I would like to say one thing though. I don't care about credit or whatever, and this isn't the form I expected it to come in. But if you've been watching the show for a while, you might know that I've been saying for a while, um, I don't know why of all of the terrible things that Donald Trump has done as president, all of the ways that he has subverted norms and all of that, he has not done the George W. Bushian sort of exploiting a tragedy. You know, there, there have been terror attacks. He hasn't seized power in the wake of terror attacks before. And I always thought that's weird for the first year, year and a half of his presidency. Um, he is doing that in this case. It's not a domestic uh, act of terror. It's not some big international incident, but it is an imagined threat to our national security that he is using to give himself the power to seize power from American landowners through eminent domain at the border, to take billions of dollars that are supposed to go to disaster relief in places like California, Puerto Rico, and all of that, and perhaps to do a trial run of how will the opposition and the media actually deal with this? Will they actually talk about it in the way, as a threat, the way it actually is, or will they just talk about the political back and forth? He's taking power literally right now, a guy who wants more state power to murder people. Let's take it seriously, people. Okay, we are gonna take a short break. When we come back, Andrew Yang is gonna be joining us. He is a nominee for the Democratic nomination for presidency, running on a diverse campaign, including universal basic income. We'll be talking about all that on the other side.
Joining us now is candidate for the presidency in 2020 and author of The War on Normal People, Andrew Yang. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. It's great to be here. Uh, very glad to have you here, and I'm excited to talk about your, your platform. We're gonna get into uh, as much of it as we can, but there is one standout part that you've been talking perhaps the most about, and that is a proposal for uh, universal basic income inside of the US. If you could explain uh, your proposal and uh, why, you're, why you're pushing it. Yeah, so my proposal, the Freedom Dividend, would put $1,000 a month in the hands of every American citizen starting at age 18. So anyone watching this, if you're 18 or over, you'd start getting $1,000 a month uh, from the government as soon as we can pass it in 2021. And the net effect of this would be to create 2 million jobs around the country, it would grow the consumer economy by 8%. It would recognize and empower millions of women who are doing work that right now is under recognized and under rewarded by the market. And it would help the those who right now have the lowest access to education opportunities the most. And that this is something that not only should we do, but we need to do because of the fact that advanced technologies are now coming down the pike that are going to displace the jobs of millions of Americans in the months to come. And if you think that's science fiction, all you have to do is look around at the truckers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the retail clerks who are going to lose their jobs. And in many cases are already losing their jobs uh, due to advanced technology. So it seems like for the first time in, in my living knowledge, we're having conversations in the US uh, you know, at, a, at a high level about basic income, but uh, it's not a new concept. There have been tests in other countries, you know, there have been proposals inside of the US as well. So uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, some of those have played out. Yeah, so as you said, this is a fundamentally American idea. It's certainly not my idea. It's been with us since the founding of the country. You know, Thomas Paine was for it, he called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King was for it, he called it the guaranteed minimum income. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists were for it in the 70s when it passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon. And this has been in effect in one state for 37 years where everyone in the state of Alaska gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked in the form of a petroleum dividend. So it, some people think of it as somehow futuristic or uh, utopian, but the fact is it has been with us since the founding of the country. And now with advanced technology, we can make this happen for all Americans the same way that oil money made it possible for the people in Alaska. And you're actually planning on conducting your own sort of trial run with a couple of families in Iowa and New Hampshire, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm personally giving $1,000 a month to a family in Goffstown, New Hampshire, and we're looking for a family in Iowa. Uh, so if you know someone in Iowa who could use $1,000 a month, just go to yang2020.com and nominate them. And the, the greatest story, John, is that a couple in Georgia, so inspired by my campaign that they're now going to be giving $1,000 a month to a family in South Carolina, just to illustrate that this is where we should go as a society. We, we're the richest and most advanced country in the history of the world. And we can easily afford $1,000 a month for each of our citizens. So there are a number of different candidates already for the Democratic nomination. Uh, as, as many people have noted, um, your campaign website lists a lot more specifics in terms of policies that you support than some of the others. Um, we, we've talked about one in the universal basic income uh, proposal, but what are some other of the, the major components of your platform? Yeah, so I'm for Medicare for all. Uh, I'm for updating GDP to actually correspond to how we are doing. Uh, because GDP is going to go up and up and lead us right off a cliff uh, as robot trucks and other things are going to be very good for the economy, but they're going to be very bad for many, many communities. So we need to update GDP to, to include things like mental health and freedom from substance abuse, childhood success rates, education, uh, average income and affordability, environmental quality and sustainability. If we change the measurements, we can actually change the way our economy rewards various corporate and individual and organizational behaviors. Um, I'm for other things too, like legalizing marijuana, uh, putting a psychologist in the White House, paying NCAA we athletes. could use one right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I was for that before uh, this administration. I just thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we should have Supreme Court justices terms be 18 years instead of lifetime appointments, so we're not all freaking out about whether uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has a cold today. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of things that we can do much, much better than we're doing right now. And to get money out of politics, the best way to do it actually would be to put money in our hands so that if you appeal to the people, you actually can fund your campaign. 
So my plan would be to give every American citizen 100 democracy dollars that can only be donated to, to a political candidate. And then if you were to get 10,000 people excited about you, you'd have a million dollars in funding and we could wash out the corporate money. Uh, well, that's certainly appealing. I'm sure a lot of our audience is gonna like that. Um, now, sort of related to what you were saying, uh, I think just yesterday the DNC released some of their guidelines for how exactly they're gonna figure out who will end up on the debate stage come June once they begin those debate debates. They're expecting potentially more than 20 candidates and they say that a combination of small dollar donate donors uh, distributed across the country as well as at least 1% in a number of different polls will allow people to qualify uh, for that for that stage. Um, what have you been doing in advance of that? You have a couple of months now to make sure that you're one of those individuals on the stage. Yeah, we're so excited about it, John. I'm already polling at 1% nationally in one poll that's included in their bucket. Um, so we're gonna be on that debate stage if we're just in two more polls between now and May. And we're very confident that we're gonna meet that criteria. But we're also gonna get the 65,000 individual contributions um, to make sure that we leave no nothing to chance. Uh, and so I'm very, very confident that come June and July, America is going to be confronting the possibility that in a democracy, there's nothing stopping a majority of us from voting ourselves a dividend. And we can make the case for universal basic income as a next step towards a trickle up economy from our people, mm -hmm. our families and our communities up. I'm gonna be on the debate stage in June making that case. Well, uh, if you do, uh, I'm gonna be pushing from now until then to make sure that all of these debates will have at least one question about the most important topic to me. And so I will broach that topic to you and that is uh, climate change and how exactly we're going to deal with it. What is the Democratic Party position going to be throughout this election? So on the topic of climate change and potential solutions, um, what do you uh, uh, propose? Yeah, I, I'm very supportive of the Green New Deal and the vision uh, contained therein. I'm for carbon tax and dividend. I'm for rejoining the Paris Accords. I'm for investing hundreds of billions of dollars in uh, more sustainable and resilient infrastructure. I'm for making environmental sustainability central to our economic measurements. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that climate change is an existential threat to our way of life. Um, but I do believe that it's tied together with economic insecurity. Because if you can't pay your bills, then it's very, very hard for you to focus on big forward looking problems like climate change. Studies have shown that living paycheck to paycheck decreases your functional IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. And it makes you much less able to, to think bigger about things coming down the road. So if we get the economic boot off of people's throats through the freedom dividend, we're then going to be able to galvanize much more energy around climate change and the big problems that we need to solve. Uh, well, look, I look forward to you giving that exact answer on the debate stage in just a couple of months. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk again as you continue your campaign. Andrew Yang, a candidate for the presidency and author, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John, definitely, I'll see you before June. Hopefully. Uh, we're gonna take one last break. When we come back, Trump supporters' relationship with the media, who do they trust, who do they not trust, and what do we do about it after this? Okay, so recently we've been talking about the cult of personality that Donald Trump has built up around himself and sustained through multiple years of being president. And to do that, you need a lot of different things. We're not gonna talk about all of them. One we're gonna focus on today is you have to destroy people's faith in any other sort of information. You have to be the one trusted purveyor of information. Um, there are a few perhaps that if you, you know, give them your, your say so, if you say Sean Hannity is a great guy, like today Donald Trump did in his, uh, in his press conference. If you say that Rush Limbaugh, great broadcaster, then people will trust them so long as they maintain your approval. He's turned on people before and we've seen them cast off into the shadows. So I apologize that I'm going to depress you a little bit, but I want you to know how successful Donald Trump has been in this particular part of developing a cult of personality. And it has to do with the faith that his supporters have in different sources of information. So we're gonna compare a few, I would say roughly on exact ends of the spectrum of trustworthiness. So first, 15% of Trump voters found Infowars trustworthy to some degree, 4% very trustworthy, 11% trustworthy. So you might look at that and say, but John, isn't that good news? Because only 15% of Donald Trump supporters find this bizarre conspiracy site on the website to be trustworthy. First of all, 
please raise your standards. Second of all, it's not the absolute value of how much trust they have in literally the least trustworthy source of news that is available on the internet. I mean, I would say I would trust 4chan over Infowars because hypothetically a rational person could wander onto 4chan and post something. That would not be allowed at a place like Infowars. So let's compare it then. Let's take the 15% who say that Infowars is at least somewhat trustworthy and compare it to a more traditional source of media. 15% of Trump voters deemed the New York Times trustworthy to some degree, which could also be worded to any degree. 5% very trustworthy, 10% trustworthy, while just 15% viewed the Washington Post trustworthy to any degree. 5% very trustworthy, 10% trustworthy. Those numbers are virtually indistinguishable from the percentage of Trump supporters that feel like Infowars is trustworthy at all. So look, New York Times can get things wrong, and they do sometimes. Uh, the Washington Post can get things wrong, and they do sometimes. But their goal is obviously not to deceive you. They don't have gigantic meetings of their journalists and their, their boards and their, their CEO and says, okay, what do we wanna push? How are we gonna lie to people? What would be the most convincing lie that we could push? But that is literally what happens in Infowars. There might be some there that are true believers, but they know how they make their money. They know what people go to them for. And people on Trump's side can't tell the difference between those two things. Like you can be frustrated with those outlets. Even me, not a Trump supporter, I'm a progressive. I can say, for instance, the New York Times editorial board, Washington Post editorials as well, they are maddening at times because of some of the people that they choose to employ. But their actual reporting is obviously in no way comparable to a purveyor of conspiracy theories and nonsense and lies and anti-Semitism and racism and God knows what else at Infowars. But that's not even the worst information. Because it's not just about can you get these people to trust insanity, it's can you kill their trust in other places. And so 52% of Trump voters deemed Infowars neither trustworthy nor untrustworthy, showing that they remain neutral on the most obviously fake site on the internet. While 32% felt it was untrustworthy, meaning that just one out of three have any sort of critical thought when it applies to a place like Infowars. Now let's compare that. Just 16% of Trump voters felt the Times was neither trustworthy nor untrustworthy, meaning he has killed their objectivity or neutrality towards the Times. 69% viewed it as untrustworthy to some degree. As Brett Ehrlich would say, nice. but. 69% have been convinced that the New York Times, one of the most just down the line, no strong positions, doesn't really risk anything, just traditional long-standing sources of news with tons of reporters deployed across the country and across the world, seven out of 10 think that it's untrustworthy. That is far, far more suspicion and doubt and fear than they have towards literally people who go on the news and dress up like giant frogs and talk about how they're trying to set off gay bombs to change your sexual orientation. Donald Trump has achieved a lot in his life, but this might be the most amazing and most maddening thing that he's been able to do, that he has turned millions of Americans into unthinking zombies in his employ. And in, the, in terms of the media, in terms of their critical thinking, it has been an all encompassing victory for him, I would say. Now, with that said, uh, that is all the time we have, not only for this show, but for the week. I do want to read at least one of these uh, reviews that you guys have left on iTunes. Uh, this one by Nikki Mendez that says, John with my morning coffee was very nice. I start my mornings with a cup of coffee and the previous day's episode of The Damage Report. Uh, John delivers the news and current issues in fair, thought-provoking ways and in a manner that isn't overly aggressive, which I love. Uh, this show might be an exception to that. I apologize, Nikki. Uh, I love his guests, Brooke in particular. I love his sense of humor, I love the discourse he brings to light on the show. Highly recommend anyone who wants to stay informed without getting too angry at the world, because John will calm you down. Um, I will try to do that next week. I wasn't really capable of doing it today, because today has been horrible. But thank you for joining me for it. Regardless of whether the news is good or the news is bad, I appreciate you always being here. And uh, next week, we're gonna have a lot of awesome guests for you. So much to cover, I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.